Uh, we're going through uh, the book of Ruth. Uh, we're in Ruth 2. And if you know the book of Ruth, it's one of the two books of the Old Testament uh, that uh, it's actually, I think I might be mistaken. It's Ruth 2, not Ruth 3. Um, it's one of the two uh, <laughs> books in the Bible named after a woman. And it's, it's the only book in the Bible uh, in the, in the, of the Old Testament that's named after a non-Jew. So it helps you realize that one, women are important in, in God's eyes, but two, that women play a very, a very important role. And in this story, what we see is what faith looks like in the midst of uh, a, a mundane life. Uh, in the book of Ruth, the, the word God is rarely mentioned. It's, it's been mentioned just a couple of times, and we'll see it here. And the idea is, is it was written in the time, uh, this takes place in the, in, the, in, in the times of the book of Judges, where the Judges talks about this endless cycle of sin and brokenness that would continue on from generation and generation. As they enter into brokenness, they would go back to God, but after going back to God and getting comfortable, they would end up in sin. And it's in this cycle we get a glimpse. It's like, the, it's like the, the camera zooms in onto one story to help us understand and for us to understand when it seems like God is invisible in your life, He's very present. So if, if, if you've ever felt like, where is God in my life? I've heard He is good. i heard He loves. But where is He in my life? Uh, through the book of Ruth, the idea is that you can actually start to see how God is working and how actually God wants to work through you in the lives of others. And so we're in Ruth 2. A couple of weeks ago, uh, the main idea was love is birthed in commitment, refined through hardship, and flourishes on the journey. It's this idea that you can't really love without commitment, and it's through that commitment we learn to love. But actually on the journey, 5, 10, 20 years later, you start to see what that, look, what that looks like. It flourishes. And today we're building upon that, uh, and specifically the idea of refined through hardship. It's this idea of love quietly and diligently builds up. Love quietly, quietly and diligently builds up. Um, and so uh, the idea is, is uh, so often we think love is this, this one great act of sacrifice. And it is. But I'm sure in your life, the time that you were most impacted was the kind of love that's quiet, it's diligent, and through a, day, through a day after day, that is when you are built up. Love, is, love quietly and diligently builds up. First, love is quiet. Ruth, uh, Ruth 2, uh, uh, verse 1. And normally I read uh, the chunk of the passage and then I kind of get into it. But through this, we want to follow the narrative. We want to we understand the, the, ebb, uh, the ebb, ebb and flow of, of the story. And so I'll read uh, basically a few verses at a time and just, just start to explain. Love is quiet. Uh, now, Naomi uh, had a relative and her, uh, of her husband, a worthy man of the, of the clan of Elimelech, whose name was Boaz. And Ruth the Moabite said to Naomi, Let me go to the field and glean among the ears of grain after him uh, in whose sight I shall find favor. And she said to her, Go, my daughter. And if you, uh, just to give you some background, uh, Naomi's husband had passed away. And so she's a, she's a widowed lady. Uh, but not only that, Na uh, Naomi is Ruth's mother in law. And uh, Naomi lost her two sons and her husband. And it's now these two that have, that have kind of stuck together. And, and Ruth has, has committed her life to serve uh, this mother-in-law so that she would be taken care of. And through it you start to see that they've gotten very close. Even in, uh, in verse 2 it says, go my daughter. Not daughter-in-law, go my daughter. It's the sense that you are now my child and I will also take care of you as you've committed yourself to me. Verse 3, And so she sent out and went and gleaned in the field after the reapers. And she happened to come to the part of the field uh, belonging to Boaz, who was, uh, who was of the clan of Elimelech. And what you need to know from this, from this verse is, in the Old Testament time, uh, the way that God designed it, it's actually very beautiful because it was an agricultural uh, city. And that's how you actually made money. That's how you, that's how you survived. Um, and so with the farmland, God actually... Uh, you know, 
uh, designed it so that uh, on the outskirts of the land, of the field, uh, it would be left for the poor and for the sojourner, for, the, for that one person coming in through the land who has no food. For that person to be able to glean, to be able to harvest, to be able to take, uh, take some of the food for themselves. And so this is what, exactly what Ruth is doing. She's going to this land, because she is the foreigner, she is the poor. And in verse uh, 3 when it says, And she happened to come to the part, in the Hebrew it's very interesting. It literally says in the Hebrew, She chanced and chanced happened to fall upon her. It's a play on words. What it's trying to show us is, for Ruth, she's just walking on by. It's not like she saw a sign and says, stop here, this is where the promised land will be. No, it wasn't like that. She saw a field and she stumbled upon it. And what you will see is the author has a play on words. She happens to fall in, but it's the sense that though we don't see God working, God is actually the one that orchestrates all of this. And we start to see this later on in the passage. Uh, there's a, a ministry called Compassion. Uh, many of you know uh, what that ministry is all about. We've actually had Compassion Sunday a couple of years ago. Uh, Compassion International is an amazing ministry uh, where they uh, target uh, to help uh, children who are poor, but also uh, uh, children uh, from, in, from these different, different countries. So they not, not, only, not only do they take care of the poor, they take care of children. Uh, but in all, their, uh, in all their advertisement, you see this portion of blue here. They call it the blue corner. And uh, I asked, uh, well, you know, someone who had worked at Compassion, who was attending our church, what's that all about? I didn't think it'd be like this blessing story. But he started to share with me the history of how that came about. It's from the same idea uh, of what happens in Ruth. In Leviticus 23, 22, it says this, and when you reap the harvest of your land, you shall not reap your, your, your field right up to its edge, no. Nor shall you gather the gleanings after your harvest. You shall leave the outskirts, you shall leave them for the poor and for the sojourner. For I am the Lord your God. And compassion, if you go back to that image, uh, compassion, uh, they do that to remind themselves that's what they do. They are called to be a ministry, an organization to help for, for those children who are in need. But as I learn more about it, they, what, the, way, what, the way that they, de they design it is, it's a tenth, it's, a, it's approximately a tenth of the longest uh, portion of the paper. To remind ourselves, you know, everything, it's, it, it's as if, if God gave us all of this, when we when we uh, share with the poor, when we give to the church, when we help to, to someone who is in need, all we're doing is giving back a portion of what God has given to us. You see, that's what, uh, that's what compassion is about, but that's why Ruth here in this story, that she has a chance for survival. It's because of their love and kindness that they have a chance to survive. You see, Christianity, let me just be very clear, uh, Christianity is not about doing the right thing. It's, it's really not. Yes, God has, put, uh, God has made rules for, for what life looks like. But if you know the New Testament, when someone asks Jesus, what are the two greatest commands, what does he say? To love God and to love others. And so it's a reminder for you today, especially if you are a believer, to know that it's not about doing the right thing. Yes, it is. It looks like that at times, but it's about loving God and loving others. As Compassion explains what this is about, they say this. They say, this is a reminder for us that we're unashamedly Christian because the Christian faith from, from its origin was always caring for the poor. So it's a, it's a claim, it's a, it's a proclamation to all that we're unashamedly Christian, that we are to love God and to love others. And if you've ever been in need, you can testify to this. Uh, the times that, that you are most blessed are the people who love you quietly. Maybe they quietly give you some money. They don't do it out in front. They don't make a big deal out of it. I know for our church, it's the people who simply help us pay the bills and they do it by simply giving money, small amounts from their small paycheck. And I know for us, for me, when I've been in need, someone has helped us and they've never made a big deal about it. 
Because why? Love is quiet. As we honored mothers, it's the reason my heart moves, right? It's why your heart is moved by your mom. Even though you may have all, have all the different tensions and arguments, at the end of the day, you know she loves you. Why? Because you know she's the one that, that took care of you, that helped you, that helped you, uh, you know, ease the pain when you had a stomach, stomach ache in, in seventh grade or whatever it would be. Because you know that that's, it's a quiet love that moves you. Love is quiet but yet diligent. Love is diligent. And let's continue on in the story. A love is diligent. You start to see that love that is not diligent is not actually love. It's acts of compassion, but it is not what love is defined as. In verse 4, And behold, Boaz came from Bethlehem, and he said to the reapers, The Lord be with you. And they answered, The Lord bless you. Then Boaz said to his young men, who was in charge of the reapers? And then he asks, uh, who, Whose young woman is this? And so Boaz is the man who owns the field. He comes and he sees this woman. And for whatever reason, he takes notice of her. Who is this woman? And it's also a sign that says that, no, that this woman is no one's. Because if, if she was someone's, that it would be known. Oh, she is this person's husband and this father's daughter. It would be known. So when she asks, Who is, uh, whose woman is this? The reality is, is it's, 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 a, it's a proclamation. No one is taking care of her. She's out to fend for herself. Verse 6, And a servant who was in charge of the reapers answered. She said, Please let me glean and gather among the sheaves after the reapers. So she came. And she continued from early morning until now, except for a short rest. She quietly comes up to the field. She does her work. She doesn't want to bother anyone. Right? And from early morning, and we start to find out throughout the story, she's the first one there. She gets there before everyone else, and she quietly diligently works. And that's what makes her noticeable for Boaz. He sees her I think, whose woman is this? What is she doing? Why is she working out, out on the field on her own? And this quiet, diligent love has made her famous. Verse 8, Then Boaz said to Ruth, so now he, he's, he's, he's uh, talking with her, uh, Now listen, my daughter, do not go to glean to another field or leave this one, but keep close to my young woman. Let your eyes be on the field that they are reaping and go after them. Have I not charged the young men not to touch you? And when you are thirsty, go to the vessels and drink uh, what the young men have drawn. You start to see that as she's been uh, quietly, diligently uh, trying to provide for the family, trying to provide for Naomi, the reason, uh, the reason Boaz notices her is because of her diligence. She's the, she's the one that's been up late at night, or up early in the morning, to, uh, one of the last ones to leave. And because she sees this, that's when she's, he says to her, uh, stay near the woman. Uh, don't go, don't go um, uh, near the men. What she, what's he saying? Be careful. I don't want you to get abused here. In this time in the land of Judges, where there was so much evil happening, he's now caring for her. Do you see? It's the quiet, diligent love that moves hearts and moves the world. Verse 10, Then she fell on her face, bowing to the ground, and said to him, Why, why have I found favor in your eyes, that you should take notice of me, since I am a foreigner? But Boaz answered her, All that you have done for your mother-in-law since... Uh, since uh, the death of your husband has been fully told to me. And now you, now you left your father and mother and your native land and came to a people that you did not know before. And that's key to, to notice. Chances are Ruth's parents lived in Moab. But for whatever reason, Ruth was committed to Naomi to take care of her. So she leaves all the comforts, inviting all the risk, inviting death into her, her life, so that she can take care of Naomi. It's quiet and diligent. Verse 12, The Lord, uh, the Lord repay you for what you have done, and a full reward be given uh, you by the Lord, the God of Israel, under uh, whose wings you, come, you have come to take refuge. Then she said, I have found favor in your eyes, my Lord. For you have comforted me and spoke kindly 
to your servant, though I am not one of your servants. In order to have quiet and diligent love, you start to notice Naomi's, uh, Ruth's character. It's one of utter, utter humility. When she says, though I am not one of your servants, she's literally saying, I am of the lowest of the lowest. In the totem, totem pole of hierarchy, uh, of social well-being in, in Israel, she is saying here, I am not even as low as the female servants, which is the lowest you can go in that class. She's like, I'm not even that. Why are you caring for me? She has utter humility. And it's because she has utter humility, she's able to be quiet and diligent about her love. She's not demanding, she's not complaining. Now you could, she could very much easily say these words, right? Yes, finally someone has taken notice of me. Finally you can see. Finally the men here can, can have some... She doesn't say that. She says, who am I? I'm only a foreigner. You take care of me. When you, when you go through enough, uh, enough of life, uh, you'll start to uh, see enough suffering, right? Those who are humble, though they hate suffering also, they have the capacity to allow suffering into their lives and, and deal with it in a healthy way. But for the proud, for those who feel like this is in, unjust and this, uh, this is not a part of my life, they have a much harder time dealing with the pain. And so they complain, they feel entitled. And you start to see Ruth, though also unjust in terms of what's going on in her life, the way that she goes about it, the way that she responds to the pain is very different. She's quiet and diligent. And because of that, people take notice. Psalm 131, uh, one of my favorite psalms, says this, O oh Lord, uh, my, my heart is not lifted up, my eyes are not raised too high. I do not occupy myself with things too great and too marvelous for me. It's simply a, uh, it's simply a, uh, a short uh, psalm that says, God, I don't understand what's happening in my life. God, I don't understand why these things have happened. But God, I may never understand. And basically what it's saying is, but it is okay. I won't lift my eyes up so high that I need to figure it out. Though I want to, God, I'll trust I do not occupy, it's this idea of you don't meditate, you don't, you don't contemplate over and over and over the, the, tragedies, tra the tragedies in your life. One of the most important lessons for us to love quietly is humility. Because it's through humility you can be quiet, you can be diligent, and through it you can change one life and even a nation. Uh, Mother Teresa, uh, many of you know who she is, you should know who she is. Uh, she uh, went to Harvard in 1982 to, uh, to do the commencement speech uh, to those who are graduating. So in 1982, Harvard was still liberal. And so many people were very uh, worried. Uh, how are people going to respond? Because Harvard is a school with many different faith backgrounds and with many different worldviews. And people were very uh, worried. You know, how are people going to respond to Mother Teresa, who's a devoted Catholic, right? Uh, so she goes up in her, in her frail body and uh, she gives this speech. And it was a simple speech. Uh, she shares about her life in Calcutta and what she does out there. Uh, she shares about how uh, she cares for those who are sick, but she, she also shares about even those who pass away, she makes sure that those bodies are taken care of. And that's, that's her life. She just lived in Calcutta to care for the poorest of the poor in the world. And as she shares these stories, she shares about a, a time where uh, there was this man in a gutter. And so she, she touches him to see if he is alive. And he is alive. And he opens his eyes and, and he sees this woman, this short, uh, this short, small, frail woman. And as, he touch, as she touches her, uh, him, he responds by saying, I don't remember the last time I felt a warm hand. As she shares these stories, all of the Harvard graduating class, I mean, they're moved. The professors, skeptics, they're moved. There's uh, people all over uh, you know, the auditorium uh, with tears streaming down their eyes. And as she shares these stories about her testimony about love, she says this, We can't do it for all, so let us begin with one. 
And that's when everyone's like challenged, right? Because they realize, oh, what she's asking us to do, we can all do. She's not, she's not asking us to go to Calcutta. She's asking us, those in your life who are in need of love, start with that one. She shares other stories about how love, uh, to be true, has to, be, has to hurt. Because it's not easy. Love, by def definition, is you're denying yourself for the betterment of somebody else. As she finishes up, for five minutes, everyone stands and, and applauds. People of different faith backgrounds, who would disagree with the God of the Bible, they can't help but be moved by love. Simple love. Love is quiet and it's diligent. Love is the title of the sermon. Love is not sexy. And what I mean by that is this. Uh, we went to, for many of us, uh, someone in our church got married yesterday. And so, you know, for our small church, basically everyone is at least one degree off from us. So, like, there's a lot of church people there. Um, it was a beautiful wedding, right? It was a beautiful wedding, you know, with all the... All the stuff, right? All the glitz and glamour. It was a beautiful wedding. But the reality is, is for that couple, and for any, any couple, for any of us in married in here, uh, you leave cloud nine, probably for a lot of us, quicker than we anticipate, right? And for, us, for a while we're in cloud nine, we think, oh, love is so great, you want to, you know, and when you're dating, you, can, you, you think about all the ways you could spend time with this person. You think about, I know a different church member in the past, uh, he would fly, uh, to the U.S. every like two months to see this girl that he's dating, right? My mind like, oh, they're so, they're so new at this, you know? <laughs> uh, what happens after time? You leave cloud nine, you come to ground zero, and sometimes you go underneath, right? Negative three, negative four. Because why? Love is not sexy. Uh, Justin Timberlake, he says he's bringing sexy back. I am bringing hard work of love back. Because that's what it is. It's not sexy. It's you get up in the morning, you take care of the kids, you go to work, you come back, you're tired. All you want to do is sleep. If you're single, you play a video game, you order some food. When you're married, when you have kids, you go home, you listen to your wife. You apologize for everything that you've done wrong again. Right? You take care of the kids. That's what love looks like. And so often in my mind, I know I'm thinking, well, I've done this and this and this and this. But I'm reminded of what love looks like. It's quiet and diligent. You just continue. Love always feels unfair. It always feels unfair. You always feel like you're getting the short end of the stick. But if you feel like you're getting the short end of the stick, that means you're doing it right. Because love, by definition, it's not about yourself. It's, it is about somebody else. Love is hard work. And that is why you need commitment. Whether it's marriage, even in family, there's a sense of commitment. You're committed to your parents. For a lot of us, with our friends, we've made some sort of bond even. My wife has two groups of friends and they, they have a whole name for their group. It's a sense that we're, we're committed to each other even though we're just friends. Why? Because by definition, love demands commitment because it's diligent. You don't just love when it's easy, you love also when it's hard. You know, marriage is viewed as a ball and chain, right? Uh, it's, you get married and now you're, 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 you have a ball and chain in your life and it drags you, it slows you down. You don't have as many options because your life is limited. It's very wrong. I think of it like this. It's a trellis. What's a trellis? A trellis is how ivy grows. It's how vines grow. It gives you structure, something to commit to. Saying that I will be committed to you, you'll be committed to me. And that's how love grows. It's not love that builds a marriage, it's marriage that builds love. It's not love that builds friendship, I would also say it's commitment that builds love in that friendship. Love is not built on one great sacrifice, it's countless, it's a lifestyle of small sacrifices. And so the world will sing, right? It's Friday night. Love is all about Friday night. It's all about the club. But it's not. It's about Monday night, right? It's about you're tired and you want to go home, but instead you go see your mom. Hey mom, how are you doing? You go see your grandmother. You call her up. You listen to your spouse. You go to that friend who is sick. This happens not when we have plenty, it's truly tested when we have nothing. 
See, love is quiet and diligent. When you think about the people that have impacted your life the most, chances are, yes, there has, there's been times of great sacrifice. But those who have made the most impact in your life, it's not that they were the smartest people or the wisest people. They were quietly there, diligent in your life, caring for you. And that's what God calls us to do. Love the one. Love is quiet and diligent. And lastly, as you love quietly and diligently, it always builds up. It always builds up. Verse 14. At meal, at, and at mealtime, Boaz said to her, Come here and eat some bread and dip your morsel in the wine. And she, said, uh, and she sat uh, beside the reapers and he passed to her roasted grain. And she ate until she was satisfied. Maybe the first time she was satisfied in a long time. And she had some leftover even. When she rose to glean, Boaz instructed his young men, saying, Let her glean even among the sheaves, and do not uh, reproach her. And also pull out uh, some of the bundles from her uh, for her, and leave it for her to glean, and do not rebuke her. Now, he's been moved by her quiet, diligent love, and now he's looking out for her. He's been built up, he's been encouraged, and now he wants to do that for others, and that's, that's the nature of love. In verse 17, So she gleaned in the field until evening, and she beat out what she had gleaned, and it was about an epa an of barley. What that means is, gleaning is this. Uh, it's this idea that as you take the harvest and you, as you clump it up, gleaning is the act of you have your, your cloth on the, on, the, on, the, on, the, on the ground, and you take a stick and you beat uh, the, uh, the wheat, uh, the, the the crop, and so that with that, with, uh, you start to uh, get the grain, and that's, that's what you can do something with. So that's what she was doing. As she does that, she has an IPA, uh, which is about 22 liters, or five and a half gallons. This is about uh, two uh, weeks worth of food, meaning in one day, from morning till evening, that's what she did. She's quiet and diligent. She's faithful. She doesn't take breaks. And because of that, she's taking notice. She's probably worked 16-hour days. In verse 18, And she took it up and went into the city. Her mother-in-law saw what she had gleaned, and, she, brought, uh, and, she, and also, she also brought out and gave her what food she had left over after being satisfied. It's this idea that after she's worked 16 hours, she takes about, what, uh, 22 liters, about five and a half gallons, probably upon her back, and she drags it back, heaves it back home for Naomi. Quiet, diligent love. And because of that, they have food for the next two weeks. Verse 19, And her mother-in-law said to her, Where did you glean today? So now they're doing their small talk, they're catching up on the day. Where have you worked? Blessed is the man who took notice of you. Uh, she's pretty excited. Uh, she asked two questions. She probably asked even more questions without even waiting for the response. She's very curious. Where did you get all this food? Like, did you steal it? Like, what happened? Uh, Blessed is the man who took notice of you. She took, uh, so she told her mother-in-law, uh, with whom she had worked, and said, The man's name with whom I work today is Boaz. And if you were to watch a movie, this is when the music comes on. This is where hope starts to, you start to feel the, the music. You start to feel hope. Their, 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 their life is changing. <clears throat> where am I? <laughs> Let's read verse 20. And Naomi said to her daughter-in-law, May he be blessed by the, by the Lord, uh, whose kindness has not forsaken the living or the dead. Literally, literally them. Uh, their husbands' uh, sons have passed away, and they're the one, only ones alive, and he's been gracious to them. Then we said to her, The man is a close relative of ours, one of our redeemers. And Ruth the Moabite said, Besides, uh, besides he said to me, You shall keep close by my young men until they have finished all my harvest. And Naomi said to, her, said to Ruth, her daughter-in-law, It is good, my daughter, that you go out with this young woman, lest in another field you be assaulted. So she kept close to the young woman of Boaz, gleaning until the end of the barley and, and wheat harvest. And she lived with her mother-in-law. It's this picture. She goes back and forth. She's quietly, dil diligently doing that work that will be benefit their family. Uh, Christianity, it's not just spiritual. It's not just we come up here, we raise our hands, and we just sing, and we think we, we're done. 
Christianity, yes, it begins on Sunday in the sense that we meet with the Lord, but it's very physical. It's very social. We're called to love the one in our lives, in our workplaces, in our families, and love them. Uh, I know a story of a friend who was in, in great uh, distress, and his, one of his friends had left for the U.S. and came back. And so this friend uh, goes to this other friend and says, and shares about all the hardship. And so this other friend takes a step back and just starts to pray over him. And this other friend who was hurt through this whole interaction says to me, I didn't want prayer. I just wanted a hug. And I think so often as Christians, as we believe in the spiritual, we, we over-spiritualize, I think, at times. Yes, prayer is absolutely important. I believe God moves through prayer. But it's, it's through the touch of a hand the paying for someone's meal who's struggling financially. It's, it's in those ways that you help and in one sense redeem. And that's what Boaz is doing. The idea of Redeemer is a uniquely uh, Hebrew uh, principle. You don't find it in other uh, cultures back in the day. It's this idea that God from the beginning, uh, even, even today, uh, God ordains governments to help with the poor, but really he also calls the Christians to help for the poor. And this idea of others helping others out was, was, was written into the, into the law, even for the Hebrews. And so Boaz, his, uh, what he was called to do is actually be the king's and redeemer. He's, he's supposed to be the, the government that helps out, gives them, gives them the, the, uh, the stamps. Food stamps. It's like, it's like that idea. That's what Boaz was doing. And you start to see, even early on in, in this Christian faith, Caring for those who are poor was engraved into the culture of his people. Verse 20. And Naomi said to her, uh, said to her uh, daughter-in-law, let me read this again. May he be blessed by the Lord whose kindness has not, for, uh, has not forsaken the living or the dead. Naomi also said to her that the man is a close relative of ours, one of our redeemers. Ruth had to die and invite death to redeem Naomi's life. Boaz, what you will see happen is he has to sacrifice again to take care of her. It's, it's written in the rules of, of love. Whenever you see a good love story, there's always sacrifice. And that's what moves you. That's what makes the great stories great. It invites death, it goes into death to redeem love, to redeem that person. Let me close with this story. Uh, I read this story uh, in Paul Miller's A Loving Life. Uh, it's, a, it's a book about the, the, the story of Ruth. He talks about a, a missionary in Southeast Asia who is trying to translate the word love. As he does, he comes to the word pa. And, he, and as he thinks about it, he thinks he doesn't really capture it, but it's, it's the only word that he knew of, of how to, how to uh, describe love. But well, one day, as he was uh, in the, by the river, he sees uh, people on the river who had fallen off the ferry. And so he goes in there, and he risks his life, and, he, and through several hours of, 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 of risking his life, he saves these different people who, were, uh, who, were, who had capsized. And as he's on the riverbank, drying out, someone goes to him, Thank you for your love. For that was pa love. Not che love, but pa love. So he asks, what's the difference between pa love and che love? He says, pa love is you just help from the outside. It's easy. Che love is you go in. You get dirty. You even risk your life for that person. That's che love. And they say, thank you for, thank you for that love. That picture is a picture of Ruth, it's a picture of Boaz, it's a picture of the Gospel. That is exactly what Jesus has done. He quietly comes down humble, loving and serving. He's a servant of all. He goes and feeds those who are broken. He heals those who were, uh, who were diseased. He's the one that comes in and He helps. And so for any of us in here, when we ask, where is God? I don't see God in my life. The reason you don't often see God in your life is He works quietly. 
behind the scenes often. It's when that friend gave you a call. That's, that's, God would say, that's what I'm doing. It's when we go out into the world to love somebody. So often people think, why is there so much suffering in the world if God is good? But if you know from Genesis 1 and 2, God gave man and woman complete dominion over the earth. And so if people are complaining to God about why they're suffering, God will simply respond, I gave you the responsibility to take care of this world. And the reality is, is we have more money, more resources, more food today to, to not only feed everyone, but even there will be leftovers. That's why the greatest commandment is to love God and to love others. And my challenge to you, my challenge to us, is that if you've heard this message, that you would intentionally think about who can I love this week. May it not be a message that you, you hear and you're moved by or you're inspired by, but may it be something that you put feet to your faith. Who is someone in need? Maybe it's your wife, maybe it's your husband, maybe it's one of your kids, maybe it's one of your co-workers, maybe it's one of your, your classmates. Who is someone <laughs> that you can love this week? And I guarantee you, we do this quietly, diligently for the rest of our lives. We will have impacted many, many people. And that's the Christian faith. Let's pray.